Hey guys, I'm gonna try my very best to make this chapter 16 review video to the point, but also cover most of the things that you're gonna need to know on the test. Okay, so here we go. First topic, symbols. So these are just these letters for the periodic table that represent an element. Um, what gets people in trouble on these, so there's the symbol, there's the element's name, uh, what gets people into trouble a lot is the symbols that have two letters, okay, like aluminum. Okay, so you might go find aluminum and be like, oh, it's A-L. Okay, that's not right. It is A-L, but the second letter is always lowercase. Okay, so it really does make a difference. All right, um, so for example, um, thallium. Okay, so I find thallium. Okay, so that, what is that, right? If I didn't know the rule that the second letter is always lowercase, I might th think that's capital T, capital I. But I know, because I'm a learned person of science, that that must be capital T, lowercase l. Which is why I usually write my lowercase l's like that, just so I can tell the difference between a lowercase l and a capital I. Okay. Um, if I can't impress that upon you, I don't know what else I can do. But just remember, the first letter is always capital. Any letters after that are lowercase. Um, okay. Structure, subatomic particles. I had more questions on this table on that 16.1 assignment than I've had for the rest of the year. When the first column said subatomic particles. And everybody says, well, what are those? Right? So we're going to talk about the where, um, their mass, and their charge. Okay, so we have three subatomic particles. Remember, sub means less than an atom. So these are the things that an atom is made out of. So we have protons and neutrons and electrons. Okay, so where are they? Where in the atom? Protons and neutrons are in the nucleus. Electrons are in the properly named electron cloud. Okay, their mass, remember we have this special mass uh, unit that we use when we're measuring things that are really small like atoms. These two have a mass of one. And that unit is atomic mass unit. Okay, they're both in the nucleus. They both have a mass of one. And then we have electrons and they are very, very, very much smaller one two thousandth or so of an atomic mass unit. So it would take 2,000 electrons to get up to the mass of one proton or one neutron. So electrons are very, very, very much, much smaller. Now we have the charge. Protons are plus one. Neutrons have no charge. And electrons are minus one. Okay. So let's kind of draw a little picture here. Okay. So here is my nucleus. I have couple positive protons in there. The other ones I'm not going to put a charge on, so those are going to be my electrons. So this is my proton, neutron, I think I said electron, I meant, uh, I just think I said electron, I meant neutron. And then I'm going to put a negative for my electrons. Okay, so I have two positive protons. So most atoms are kind of rule is if I have a certain number of protons, I will have the same number of electrons because the positives and the negatives have to cancel each other out. So if I have two positive protons, I'm going to put two negative electrons out here in the cloud. Okay, and they would be buzzing around, taking up this whole space in the cloud. All right, so we have my electron cloud here with two electrons which is the same number of my two protons. Neutrons might be different. Okay, they're a little bit more complicated. 
All right, topic three, atomic theory. The only name I asked you to know is John Dalton. Okay, he is the guy who officially proposed atomic theory and a couple of the key ideas of his atomic theory. Everything is made of atoms. Okay, he said it doesn't matter if it's a solid or a liquid or a gas or something that we eat or something that grows out of the ground. Everything is made of atoms. This was a pretty revolutionary idea. Okay, the idea of atoms had been around for a while, but nobody had quite got been so bold as to say everything is made of atoms. Okay, um, atoms of the same element are the same. Okay, so he's saying if I have two atoms of oxygen, they are the same somehow. Okay, he probably talked that they were similar in mass, but really this, the, the whole idea we're trying to get to is that these ideas seem really simple to us, but they were revolutionary at the time. Okay, um, third idea, same, except atoms of different elements are different. Okay, so he said there's something essentially different between an atom of carbon and an atom of oxygen or an atom of arsenic to an atom of bromine, anything. Okay, um, and I would say fourth key idea, I think we listed five in the notes, but I'm just going to try to simplify here. Um, when we have reactions, we, that is a rearrangement. Okay, it's a rearranging of atoms, not a creation of atoms, and not a destruction of atoms, but a rearrangement. Okay, so maybe before the reaction, I had this molecule and this molecule. Maybe I had two of these. I know where I'm going with this, trust me. Okay, and then after a reaction, I'm going to take all of these apart and put them together differently. Okay, so if you look, the arrows like the reaction, okay? I know those colors, I tried to pick colors so we could tell apart in the video. Um, so before the reaction, I had two purple ones. After the reaction, I have two purple ones. Before the reaction, I had one, two, three, four green ones. After the reaction, I have one, two, three, four green ones. So this reaction didn't make any atoms and it didn't destroy any atoms. It just rearranged the atoms. Okay, and this was kind of a crazy idea at the time. Okay, next idea is this idea of an electron cloud. Okay, I may not even write anything down here. I just wanted to remind myself to talk about this. So here's my cloud from before. But there's only these two itty bitty tiny electrons, okay? Why do we, but the whole cloud, I would call this whole space, okay? So remember, let's we'll see if I can do it. Ah, I think my frame rate speed is too small. But if my hand's moving really, really fast, it's taking up the whole picture, right? Basically, it's kind of getting weird. But um, the idea is if something's moving really fast, it needs lots of space. Okay, so if I check back in on this, like, a microsecond later, a microsecond would be um, a thousandth of a second, this electron might be here, and this electron might be over here. Okay, they're moving extremely fast. Okay, so that's why we describe it as an electron cloud, is because their motion is so fast that they take up that whole space. Okay, all right, this is where people usually get befuddled. All right, we have some numbers and values that we assign to atoms and to elements. Okay, so the atomic number is the number of protons. Always, all the time. This is also what determines the element you have. Okay, so if I have my periodic table, 
Okay, this goes up by one. So we have 13, 14, 15, 16. That's the atomic number. That's the number of protons. So if I have an atom of aluminum, it has 13 protons. If I have an atom with 13 protons, it is aluminum. Okay, if somehow I was able to shove an extra proton in there, it would not be aluminum anymore. Okay, if I take an aluminum atom and somehow add a proton to it, it is now a silicone atom because it has 14 protons. Okay, so it is always the identifying trait that makes it a certain element's atom. Um, mass number is protons plus neutrons. Okay, or you could think of it as how many particles are in the nucleus. Okay, so remember we said on the last page, protons and neutrons are each in the nucleus. So if I drew an atom, I'm just going to draw the, no, I'll draw the whole atom, why not? Okay, and I'm going to always have positives in my protons. Okay, and I'll have the same number of electrons outside the atom. Okay, so for this particular atom, I said, what's the mass number? Okay, so I could say, okay, it's protons plus neutrons. I have one, two, three, four protons plus one, two, three, four neutrons. Mass number is eight. Okay, notice I didn't count the electrons. They have nothing to do with the mass number, nothing. Okay, or I could calculate the other way, how many particles in the nucleus, and just count all together. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Either way, we would get eight here. Okay. I cannot emphasize enough, this is not that number. Okay, it is not that decimal number in the periodic table. Okay, think about this description. Protons plus neutrons. Could I have half a proton? Could I have a point zero one of a proton? No. This is always got to be a whole number because we are just counting. We're counting how many particles. Okay, I can't have part of a particle, so this is going to be a whole number. Okay, and then we have this idea of average atomic mass. Okay, so this takes into consideration, I'm going to say considers all isotopes. Okay, so we're going to talk about isotopes a little bit more on the next page, uh, but just kind of remember um, isotopes are the same element, but with a different mass, okay? So maybe I have carbon 12, okay? So this is the mass number. So some atoms of carbon have a mass of 12. Some atoms of carbon have a mass of 13. Some atoms of carbon have a mass of 14, okay? But they don't all equal in the same amount. Like I won't, it's not like for every one of these, I have one of these, I have one of these. They're not even, okay? So something like 98% of all carbon has a mass of 12, okay? I'm going to say 1.5% has a mass of 13. And that leaves only half a percent left to have a mass of 14. Okay, so I want 12 to count for 98% of the mass that I will call the average atomic mass. So the way that I do that is I take that mass, 12, times the equivalent of 98%, which is 0.98. Okay, so I have the mass times the percent, but I make it as a decimal. So instead of 98%, I said 0.98. Okay, so that will give me the proportion of my answer from the mass at um, 12 atoms. Okay, so I'm going to take that and add it. I'm going to do the same thing with the other isotopes. So mass of 13, I want to count for 1.5% of my answer. So I'm going to take it times 0. 0, 0.015. Remember when you go from a percent to a decimal, you move it two spots 
to the left. Okay, and then we have a third isotope, so we need to do this one more time. So I want the ones with a mass of 14 to count for half a percent, so that would be 0 0.005. All right, so get my calculator. 12 times 0.98 is 11.76. 13 times 0 0.015 is 0 0.195. And 14 times 0 0.005 is 0 0.07. So I add those up. And I get 12.025. Okay, remember our mass, our unit is 12.025 atomic mass units. Okay, so let's always check on these. The does this make sense? Okay, so 98% of all of my atoms have a mass of 12. Okay, if almost all of the atoms have a mass of 12, the average should be close to 12, right? Okay, if our average is not close to the mass that almost every atom is, we probably messed up. Okay, so we got a mass of 12.025. Uh, the real mass of carbon is 12.01. I kind of made my best guess on these percentages, so I was a little off, but that's not bad. Um, but the idea is your average atomic mass should be close to the mass of the isotope that is most common. Okay, so these three things you've got to get figured out. Okay, atomic number is just protons. That's what determines the element. Mass number protons plus neutrons, or how many things are in the nucleus. It's always a whole number because you're just counting particles. But then when we get into doing some math, we don't have to have a whole number anymore because we're doing averages. Okay, when we start doing averages, we're not going to have whole numbers anymore. So it's the mass times the percent is a decimal for one isotope, plus mass times percent is a decimal for the next isotope, plus mass times percent is a decimal of the next isotope. Okay, next topic, isotopes. Probably should have put this first. Okay, so key idea, they are atoms of the same element. That's not an E. which means they have the same number of protons, right? Because that's what determines what element we have. But they have a different mass number. Okay, so mass number was protons plus neutrons. So... If they have the same number of protons but a different mass, what would be causing that different mass if the protons didn't change? So that must be neutrons. Okay, so we're going to draw, use the example from the last question. I'm just going to draw two of them because I'm lazy. Okay, so I have carbon 12 and carbon 13. Okay, so these are considered isotopes of each other. They are both carbon, okay, same element, but they have a different mass number. There it is. One's 12, one's 13. Okay, so I'm going to go protons, neutrons. I like to use those symbols for protons and neutrons because that also reminds me protons are positive and neutrons have no charge. Okay, so a carbon 12 atom would have how many protons? Okay, well, I need a periodic table to answer that question. I find carbon. It is atomic number six, which means always and forever, if it is a carbon atom, it has six protons. Okay, so it has six protons. If its mass number is 12 and it has six protons, it must also have six neutrons. Six plus six gives us our 12. Okay, another isotope of carbon is carbon-13. If it is carbon, it must, 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 always and forever have six protons. 
if its mass number is 13 and it has six protons, how many neutrons must it have? What number plus six would give us 13? Okay, well, the answer is seven. Okay, so in general, these guys are going to react similarly. Okay, so most of your body besides the water part, which it, you know is a big part, but if you took all the water out of your body, you'd have a lot, a lot of mostly carbon left over. And some of that carbon is carbon-12, and some of that carbon is carbon-13. They can form the same molecules in the same way. Okay, sometimes one isotope is radioactive. Okay, and we're talking radioactive in chemistry. That just means that it's unstable. Okay, it might break down. It might release radiation in the effort to become stable. Okay, so the last fairly common isotope of carbon is carbon-14, which would have six protons and eight neutrons. And carbon-14 is radioactive. Okay, it is unstable this way. Okay, um, and so that's kind of the story there. So that particular isotope is radioactive, it's unstable, but it could still form the same kinds of elements and compounds as the other two. All right, here's where you get to see a really amazing drawing of the periodic table. Uh, I always mess it up. This is actually not that bad. Except for this part's way too skinny. I don't know why I did that. It's okay. It's okay. I was going to make this anyway. Looks like I'm one short. There we go. Okay. So, we have our periodic table and we can break it down a few ways, okay? We can look at a vertical collection of elements, up and down, okay? I would call that a group. When we're talking about a group, remember they have similar traits. Okay, so if I looked at my periodic table, what I tried to do is this. Okay, this group right here. So groups are vertical. Groups contain elements that have similar traits. I'll try to use a different, obviously different color here. Then sideways is a period. Okay, and we would say periods don't have similar traits. Okay, they don't. They do not have similar traits. And on the next page, when we start talking about dot diagrams, we're going to come back to this idea and try to establish why groups have similar traits and why periods don't have similar traits. Um, but for right now, I'm going to leave it right there, okay? Groups are up and down, so there's a group, there's a group, there's a group, and every element in this group would have a similar property, and every element in this group would have similar properties, and there we go, okay? All right, next concept. I promise we're sort of getting to the end. Remember, this is, I'm trying to make it comprehensive so it includes everything you should hopefully uh, baseline need to know. So electrons in energy levels. Okay, so remember we said earlier, for the most part, for right now at least, we're going to assume an atom has the same number of protons and electrons because our atoms are neutral. We haven't started talking about anything besides neutral atoms yet. Okay, so that means... If I had an atom of maybe argon, OK, 
Okay, so I find argon on my periodic table. There it is. It's number 18, which means it has 18 protons and 18 electrons. Okay, we're not talking about neutrons right now. We can kind of leave them out of this conversation. Okay, in the electron cloud, these 18 electrons are not equal. Okay, so remember we kind of put our electrons on shelves. Okay. And remember, just like if you were filling a shelf safely, in the real world, you want to fill the lower shelves first and then put stuff on the second shelf and then put stuff on the third shelf. We're going to do the same thing with electrons. Okay? But it's a weird shelf because the first energy level is small and the next energy level shelf is a little bigger and the third shelf is even bigger and the fourth shelf is really big. Okay, so our, here's our shelf, but we're gonna still follow the rules. We're gonna fill this shelf up first, and then we're gonna fill this one up, and then we're gonna fill this one up. Okay, so the first energy level can hold, holds two electrons. The second energy level holds eight electrons. Third energy level can hold 18 electrons and the fourth energy level holds 32 electrons. Okay, but we're gonna follow the rules and fill the lowest levels first. And my shelf kinda got messy here. This might help. Okay, there's my shelf. All right, so remember when we're doing these, so I put the symbol, and then I would say how many electrons would go in each energy level or in each shelf if we follow the rule that we fill the lowest shelves first. Okay, and remember when we're out of electrons, we stop. We cannot keep going if we don't have electrons. So we have 18 electrons. How many are we gonna put in the first energy level on the first shelf? Well, we have 18 electrons. We want to fill this shelf up. It can only hold two. So remember, this is when you put that little superscript that says two electrons. Okay. In the second level, which holds eight electrons, how many are we going to put? Okay, we had 18 electrons. We already put two in the first level. So we only have, can fit eight in there because that's the maximum. Okay. Third energy level. Um, it can hold up to 18. How many electrons have we already put on the shelf? All right, we have already put eight, nine, ten electrons where they belong. We only have eight left because we have a total of 18. So I'm gonna put eight right there. Okay, so I have two electrons in the first energy level, eight in the next second, and eight in the third, and then I'm out of electrons. Okay, let's try one more. Why not an easy one? Okay, boron. So I find boron, it has five protons, which means it also has five electrons. Okay, I'm gonna put, maximum I can fit in the first energy level is two. Okay, uh, and how many electrons would I have left? Boron was atomic number five, so I only have three left to put in the next energy level, okay? All right, last page, <laughs> dot diagrams, okay? So it's always their symbol plus dots for valence electrons. Okay, this is a very important term. Okay, so this is electrons in highest energy level. Okay, so if I go back to what I just did on the previous page, if I was doing my symbol for argon, it would have eight dots because there's eight electrons on the highest energy level I put electrons. If I was doing a dot diagram for boron, it would have three dots because there's only three electrons in the highest level. Okay. Um, so let's try and remember the cheat for this. Okay. The number of dots 
equals the last digit of the group number. Okay, so if I'm looking at this group, I want to know how many dots to put around the F for fluorine. Okay, I go up. The group number is a 17. Some periodic tables you might see it called 7A. Either 17 or a 7 end with a 7. So I'm going to put 7 around there. Okay, there is a top slot, a bottom slot, a left slot, and a right slot. Okay, you don't want to double up until you have to. But if I want to do a dot diagram for chlorine or bromine or iodine or astatine, any of these in this group, they would all have seven dots. Okay, um, so how about calcium? Okay, calcium is in group two. So I would draw calcium symbol CA with two dots. And again, it doesn't matter uh, where they are, but I'm not going to double them, like partner them up with each other until I have to. So let's go back to this idea. Why do groups can you have any elements that have similar traits? Well, because they also have the same number of valence electrons. Okay, so if I drew the dot diagram for, these are out of order, but um, Okay, so those are the, um, I might as well draw them all, um, the six elements in group two. Okay, they all have two dots for the two valence electrons. Okay, the valence electrons are also the electrons involved in reactions. Okay, so they react the same as each other, these elements that are in the same group because they have the same number of electrons that are going to be involved in reactions, okay? So that's the explanation there. All right, so metals. We have these three categories of elements here. So metals are shiny solids. Generally, there's the one exception, which is mercury. Which is a liquid. Okay, so, but mostly they're solids. Uh, we have a word for shiny, which is lustrous. They are malleable, which means they can be hammered and shaped. Right? I can bend them rather than they would just break. And they are ductile, which means I can pull them into wires. Okay, so where are the metals on the periodic table? Okay, so here's my periodic table. The metals are almost everything. Okay, so besides hydrogen, so imagine not hydrogen, all of these, all of these. Okay, so if I put my hand covered up just this corner and hydrogen, everything else is metals there. Okay, so almost everything all the metals that you've heard of are right here right we've got sodium titanium gold silver um tin oh almost covered up tin there's tin okay so it's almost all of them non-metals are the opposite of metals okay so they would be dull if they were solid not shiny okay i'm going to say these are mostly gases Yes, some of them are solids. Um, the opposite of malleable would be brittle. Okay. So brittle means if I uh, try to change its shape, its shape doesn't change. Okay, if I apply enough force, it will just sh snap. It'll just break. Okay. Um, it does not mean that it is weak. Okay, so for example, a diamond is considered very brittle. I could apply a lot of force to it. Before it would bend, it will just break. Okay, so it's more the idea that it will break rather than bend, and malleable will bend rather than break. Okay, so things can be very, very hard and really not bend or break, but it's kind of, well, what will it do first? Okay, 
Um, and ooh, one more thing I forgot to say about metals is they are conductors. All right, so remember, conductors means they can transport heat or electricity. Okay, metalloids are in between metals and non-metals. Oh, no. Okay. Sorry. My laptop screen went to sleep, and I was worried it was my, this video was going to be all for nothing. Um, so they're kind of my, maybe a little malleable, maybe a little bit brittle. Um, we have a word for them called semiconductors. Okay, which means they can sometimes conduct electricity. They might need a little bit of a boost to be conductive. Okay, so I said from about here, from about here all the way to the left is all metals. This very, very top left corner is non-metals. And these guys kind of in the middle. All right, so there's some... These guys, they kind of make up a little bit of a diagonal here, are our non-metals, or sorry, excuse me, our metalloids. All right, and the very last thing we had in the notes is stardust. Okay, so hydrogen and helium, they think are the only elements that really came out of the Big Bang. Okay, um, so these are what compose stars. Okay. So in stars, they're using hydrogen and making helium. Eventually, they're going to run out of hydrogen, okay? And they're going to explode, okay? They're going to go through several stages. They're going to, you know, expand into a red dwarf. It might expl um, explode um, in a, a supernova or something. But star... Um, life cycle and death I know they weren't technically alive but astrology or not astrology astronomy refers to their death as the end of when they're active um, makes bigger elements okay like carbon like a, and like oxygen right so water has oxygen in it which means all of those atoms of oxygen came from a star going through its life cycle and death. All the atoms of iron come from a life cycle of death. Anything in your world that isn't a hydrogen atom or a helium atom came from stars. Okay, so all of Earth came from the debris from some star that had used up all its fuel and died. Okay. So I realize this video is way too long, uh, but hopefully you found it at least a little bit helpful. Um, remember, we're planning on a test on Friday the 17th. So let me know if you need any help or need any of these concepts explained a little more before then. Thank you. Bye.